an email from Nick. Here's what he writes. I moved to Parker County, Texas two years ago with my wife and our three dogs. The property that we purchased and currently live on is five acres and it's located outside of Springtown. The property is surrounded by other similar sized properties, but there are large wooded sections. The back three acres is open to the neighbor that borders me to the west, and they have a thick scrub brush on the back side of their property. The metal barn that was here when we bought the place sits 20 feet from the property line and 80 feet from our back door. Now, I'll tell you all of this so that you can get a mental image of how everything is positioned on the property. When we first moved in during the summer of 2021, we were excited to start some projects and make our place our own. After picking up a thousand pounds of scrap metal and giving the pasture a good bush hogging, the back acreage was looking a lot better than it had when we first moved in. We made a plan to move my wife's horse from her grandmother's property to ours once I fixed the fence that ran down the western property line one June evening, after it all cooled down, I started making the necessary repairs to the fence when I heard something moving around in the brush 15 yards in front of me. Now, it sounded like a large animal trying to be quiet, but failing miserably. I wasn't concerned since this part of Texas has deer and hogs and other wild game, and that's what could have been making the noises. 30 minutes into this episode, with on and off breaking of sticks and crunching leaves, I started to feel uneasy, like something was looking right at me or through me. Now, I'm a big man, 6 foot 4 and 325 pounds, and having hunted the woods and swamps of Mississippi all my life, there's not much that has raised a hair on the back of my neck. But even so, something had my nerves on the edge so I quickly finished the work and walked back to the house at a fast pace. After getting into the house and shaking off the feeling of being watched, I turned on the baseball game and I was able to relax. Later on, my wife reminded me that she had to go out of town for the next few days for work. She asked about the fence and I told her that I would have it completed, but I didn't mention the incident that made me nervous. She asked me if I could clean out the barn while she was gone as well. Well, naturally, I waited until the last day before my wife came home to start this work. There was no electricity running to the barn, just a floodlight on a pole pointed toward the south entrance. So I had to get everything cleaned out during the day. While filling my truck bed up with old water hoses and boxes of books and newspapers from no telling how long, I worked my way toward the northwest corner of the barn. That's when I started to notice a rancid smell the closer I got to that corner. After finally getting the wall of boxes cleared out, I found the source of the smell. There were old horse blankets covered in gore and what looked to be an old deer carcass. I thought it was strange, but stray dogs and coyotes are opportunistic, and if no one is bothering them, I guess that they would take up shelter in the barn. Well, I gagged a few times at the smell, and I managed to get all the terrible-smelling horse blankets in the bed of my truck and on the way to the county dump. And when I got back home that evening, I got cleaned up, and I let the dogs out to use the bathroom and get some exercise. It was about 30 minutes before dusk, and that uneasy feeling that I had of being watched hit me again. I wasn't the only one that had an immediate feeling of eyes peering at me from somewhere. All of my dogs were on alert. They were looking over toward the barn. The biggest of these dogs is a 120-pound Great Pyrenees Retriever mix. He was a real protective dog, but he was frozen in that spot. He was growling and his hackles were raised. I gathered myself and got the dogs back inside. I still couldn't shake the feeling that there was something glaring at me through the windows. The thought crossed my mind that there might be a big cat in the area, even though the game wardens will tell you that there aren't, but I hadn't seen any tracks or signs. So after closing all the blinds, I felt a little better. But that was until about 9.30 when I heard my neighbor's dog raising hell. Against my better judgment, I went to the gun safe and got out my 300 blackout AR-15. I racked around in the chamber and I flipped on the weapon-mounted light, I stepped out the back door. 
The instant that I pointed the light toward the barn, there was an ear-piercing howl or growl that vibrated in my chest. Now, I'm not a believer in cryptids or that UFO stuff, so I started walking toward the barn with my muzzle trained on the entrance. I had only made it ten steps before this... Well, it was this thing. It jumped into the beam of my light just inside the barn doors. So I froze in my tracks out of sheer disbelief. This beast was standing on its hind legs with its front arms hanging down just above its knees. And it was black. It was blacker than dark. The next thing I noticed was the claws on the end of the raccoon-like hands. They glistened in my light. They looked long and dangerous. I slowly raised my rifle, working that light up the creature, and I saw the ugliest canine face that I've ever seen in my life. Thick, vicious drool that hung from its yellow, jagged teeth, and suddenly it looked like the edges of its mouth had turned up in some sort of a twisted grin. Its eyes reflected green from the light. I had no idea what I was looking at but I knew that 30 rounds of 300 blackout probably wasn't enough to take it down before it got to me. I got lucky, and it turned, and with one fluid motion, it jumped over the back set of barn doors and started running into the night. From the time the creature jumped into the light, from the time it suddenly turned away and bounded over the back barn doors and ran off, crashing through the brush, may have been a total of 30 seconds. I got a good enough look at it to know that I was keeping my gun loaded and lights on and my doors locked that night. The next morning, I went out and measured where I thought the height of the beast was. My best guess was that it was seven foot tall, and the barn doors it cleared without effort were even with my chin. I found large canine-style prints all over the dirt floor of the barn. My wife came home later that day, and I chose not to tell her about any of the events that happened the night before. It has been almost two years since that night, and I haven't seen, heard, or felt the presence of anything on or around our property since. My best guess is that the thing had been staying in the barn while the previous owners had been gone, and I disturbed it by cleaning everything up. Hopefully, I never have another encounter with anything like this again. Oh, man, hopefully you don't. And you're going to catch some flack from the audience for not telling your wife. And there's a lot of stories that guys will say that. They'll say, oh, I saw this monster, but I never told my wife about it. It was on our property. It was close to the house, but I never told my wife about it. Uh, You know, honestly, I might not tell my wife because I know that it would scare her to death. She probably wouldn't want to live here. So I get it. And I, I almost support what you're doing. If you hadn't had any problem, that's a good deal. But you're going to catch some flack, so <laughs> don't read the comments. How about that? Don't read the comments to the man who, who wrote this. Nick, I think was his name. I appreciate the story, man. This was great. You think you saw a dog man or a werewolf? What's the difference in a dog man and a werewolf? Some people say, well, the werewolves change and the dog men don't, but how do you know when you see a dog man if it didn't change like an hour before? So how do you know? How do we know all these things? I don't know. All right, buddy. Thanks for the story. All right, here's another encounter that I think is good. And I've done quite a few videos on the Mogion. He 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 phonetically writes it out so that I'll say Mogion, but it's spelled M-O-G-O-L-L-O-N. So I call it Mogolon. I like, that sounds better to me. So I'm just going to call it Mogolon and make everybody from that area mad. But it's easier for me to say kind of limited in my dialect from where I live, the way I've talked all my life, and it's Mogollon. I've told y'all this before, it's Mogollon from now on. This event took place on top of the Mogollon Rim, towering above the Sonoran Desert. The Rim country of central Arizona averages elevations from 5,000 to 11,000 feet. I'm a multi-generational Sonoran Desert native with 60 plus years of experience exploring and tracking and hunting and fishing and diving and studying a place filled with a huge population of unique plants and wildlife, second to only the Amazon Basin. That is amazing. 
I had no idea it was so diverse in wildlife and plants. I need to see this place. Anyway, back to the story. There are endless canyons and, uh, I'm not sure what this word is, riparian areas filled with water, lakes, rivers, creeks, and springs bubbling up from the hard pan desert floor that support hundreds of animal species. Unlike most of the country, Arizona is dominated by mountains some thousands of feet high, iron-filled mountains that screw up your cell phone reception and paint the skyline with incredible views. Here we have 50-foot giant uh, sagaru trees and boonjum trees that look like giant silver carrots growing backwards out of the ground and thousands of plant species that support a cacophony of wildlife. Above the tangle of the desert, the rim country cliffs and canyons lead up to aspen, dug fir, spruce, ponderosa pine, alligator juniper, and oak forest in the Mogollon Rim, forests that continue into the New Mexico, Utah, Colorado area. Wild scrub and transition wilderness running below the pine forest at the feet of these mountains run for hundreds of square miles, like the Mazat, Mazat, <clears throat> man, this guy's got a bunch of words in here I'm having trouble with, Mazatzal, Matazel Wilderness. Here there are few, if no, roads leading into hidden canyons that run for miles. Hogbacks and mesas perforated with deep chasms, and in those canyon walls there are hidden travertin caves that serve as a sanctuary for critters who migrate up and down the rim face. With the changing weather and seasons, more than they do latitude longitudinally, it's almost like a vertical migration. The untouched wilderness populated with coos deer, mule deer, antelope, Roosevelt elk, lions, jaguars, and black bear every two square miles, coyotes, Mexican red wolves, reintroduced wolves from Montana, uh, jag, jag, jaguar, I don't even, I can't even going to attempt it, otters, coat, Cody Mindy, skunks, ringtail cats, raccoons, javelina, golden and bald eagles, bateo hawks, a huge diversity of birds, dozens of constrictor snakes like California king and 11 kinds of rattlesnakes. That's just a sample. Hey, y'all, when y'all write these, I'm not being critical of this man, but when you guys write these stories, uh, you don't have to list every tree, every plant, every animal that lives in the, the area that you are. People just want to hear your experience. And it, this is interesting. I'm not being critical, but uh, I didn't edit this. But normally I would just take all that out because it's not really germane to the story. Maybe it is. Maybe we'll find out. I know I'm screwing this story up. Y'all just hang with me. Let's see what he says. There's quicksand in the canyon bottomlands, chub minnows and spoon-shaped catfish, and the Tinaha Springs filled and spilling naturally into the eroded stone pools, stepping down the canyon walls, hot springs bubbling up in the rocks, and giant sycamore and cottonwood trees with hand-sized leaves that provide evaporative cooling shade from the sun. Arizona's wild country will take your life if you go in overconfident, untrained, and unprepared. I started studying the indigenous plants and animal species with family as a child, and I followed that tradition with my kids. Knowledge is power, and doing well in this rugged place is a lot of work. In a place where so many others fail, they get lost and they die of thirst or of exposure. Well, here's my first experience with the roaring huge Mogollon anomaly. In 1988, I was drawn for elk in the SW Cliffs, the rugged slopes of the Mogollon Rim, near the Blue Ridge Reservoir. My cousin Dan and I travel regularly here to scout the area, and on this trip, we came with my sister, my wife, and my pioneer grandmother, all anxious to escape the desert heat and camp under the brightest Milky Way stars you've ever seen in the West. Elk herds are crept. Creps, crepus, man, dude, you got to give me easy words. I can't, C-R-E-P-U-S-C-U-L-A-R, whatever that word is, meaning they're most active at sunrise and sundown. 
We scouted and tracked and glassed the area, and then we left camp at 3 a.m. and walked the game trails for at least two hours before we set up around two heavily used wallows and open flats grass flats where there are plenty of service berries, lupine owls, clover, and Sitting in the dark, saturated in skunk scent, the sound of herd activity came from behind. It was all around in moments, and I sat captive in my spot as mostly elk cows and calves poured around and passed me like water. I was surrounded, and I tried not to breathe too loudly in my excitement and give myself away. But once they had moved on ahead, I got up to glass their movement, and to my amazement, They were disappearing near or off the 5,000-foot high granite boulder cliffs and crags into hidden elk toeholds, horse-sized animals disappearing off the edge where I was loath to stand upright for fear of being blown off or falling thousands of feet to my death. I realized that they had already made us. Our hunt was over for the morning. We found each other moving out into the open and decided to work back uphill walking on rock down in an arroyo running between rolling hills topped with ponderosa pines, willow scrub, tall grass, and sapling small trees. We were headed up east, and the rising sun began to shine and warm golden light at us. Through the trees, the walking was slow. It was steep on and in loose rocks and gravel, and some of it escaping, bouncing back downhill behind us as we picked our way uphill. Blue jays, robins, and dusty flycatcher chattered and flitted around us. They were chasing clouds of flying bugs with their wings lit up by the sun. It was turning out to be a beautiful morning. Suddenly, up on the top of a hill, 50 foot or so above me, and on my right, something huge and heavy came crashing down. It was coming straight at me. It was running over small trees and through the grass and willows. It was so heavy, I felt its steps, its weight, through my boots as it sent rocks crashing down at us. And then it stopped. It was 20 to 30 feet above me, and I couldn't see anything. I only heard its heavy breathing, its puffing and panting. The thrashing and wagging of the tall grass and willows that bounced around its form just above us. Then it let out a horrendous roar that must have lasted five to ten seconds. It's not a lion or a roar of a jaguar, not a bear, not a bull, nothing like an elk. This sounded like a male gorilla recording, only larger and much louder, and it lasted much longer. It was so loud that it shook me and vibrated my sternum and my ribs and my throat and in my stomach. And immediately, Dan and I drew pistols, and we backed up and away slowly. I was anticipating an explosion, an impact, a blinding flurry, a giant flying down upon us. But instead, it remained in its hole above us. The sound of its breathing, grunting, and liquid gurgling, growling throat noises was terrifying. We backed up, trying to move up the hill on the loose footing and not fall down. Two big bore pistols pointed directly at the threat. It was still moving and crashing back and forth like a boxer pacing side to side, but we still couldn't see it. We turned and scrambled up to the top of the hill. I looked back at the depression it made in the hillside grass and willows, and it was gone. That was equally terrifying, and now I noticed the silence was deafening, and all the birds had stopped singing. It was eerily stone quiet. I was sure now it was coming, and running up the backside of the hill out of view, or above from another side, for an ambush. But we stopped, and we held our ground back to back, each taking 180 degrees, and we waited, but there was no sound. There was no noise from birds, nothing at all. Time passes slowly when you're waiting for someone, or in this case, something horrendous, but nothing came. So we picked our way along the wash for another five minutes and repeated our defensive posture back to back again. And still, all the birds were gone. There was nothing flying. And we were being watched. Sure, we were being tracked. It was an overwhelming sense of dread. We glassed the open spaces and we were patient and we'd stop and we'd listen. And as we walked, we found the road. 
and instead of feeling relief, I realized I was angry. I was robbed of an outcome, an answer, a release, a solution, a discovery, and I began to argue that it was time to turn back and get this son of a bitch and hunt it down and own it. Well, Dan looked at me, his eyes drooped down to half-mast, and then he said slowly and calmly, No, I'm tired of this crap. Let's get out of here and get some breakfast. And if it keeps following us all the way back to camp, we'll kill it after we eat. Now, that was funny. He was wise. He made me laugh, and that was that. We went back to camp for breakfast. The high alert status and giant knot in my stomach was gone, and when we got back to camp, we didn't expound on what had happened until later. We were glad to be back, and we let the stress go, and when we did tell them, everyone looked at us with heads bobbing up and down, and when I recreated the sound of the roar, They were incredulous and anxious, and the women were ready to break camp. I never smelled any stench. I never saw any cranial crest or saw any eyes. I actually saw nothing, not a zip, zilch. I've seen red eyes shine in the past while freezing in a blind in a place called Green's Peak, but nothing on this encounter. There are a couple of cowboys I've watched here on YouTube and they filmed themselves rounding up cattle and riding and roping on some of the fine horse flesh and incredible mules and crossing through impossible places. Well, they were filming themselves in a pack train supplying outfitter camps high up in the selways of Idaho or Montana. And suddenly, that exact same roar I heard years ago drowned out their conversation and their jaws dropped and their eyes widened. The one with the camera phone said, let's get the hell out of here, and the camera went black. Wow, it all came back to me, and after listening to some of your stories, I decided to write my account and send it off to you. I have another story involving me and my son and several sheriff's deputies in a helicopter chasing something huge across a golf course in the deserts of Cave Creek, Arizona in 2004. I'll send that one next. And then he signs the email. First, let me say I wasn't being critical. Almost uh, probably 30 or 40% of the emails I get, uh, they'll either list, like I said early in this narration of this story, they'll list every animal in the place or they'll list all their guns and every grain of bullet they shoot and, you know, all that stuff. And uh, it gets a little frustrating for me because I like, I want to know what you went through. I don't want to know what you have. I don't mind leaving it in. I don't, it's just, and it's probably just me. It's probably just me. But otherwise, when he did get to the story, this was amazing. Now, this Mogollon, Mogion monster seems to be a deep, long lasting legend in that area. And I think it's very interesting. I bet I have done no less than 20 stories on the Mogion monster and I think it's amazing. I wonder if anybody has any images or videos that they think might be something that's not blurry that they think might be the this monster. But this is a fascinating fascinating phenomenon and I want to thank the man for sending this. He's a good writer and I appreciate him taking the time to to put this together and send this to me because I know it takes a lot of time out of your out of your day to sit down and write these and I appreciate you so much so there you have it all right once again thank you for joining me yes I'm busy at work and I am just uh doing these podcasts when I have some time it's Sunday morning I'm working all weekend I haven't had a day off and uh I took a couple of days off two weeks ago just to cut my grass and get some work done around here Otherwise, I'm not letting up, y'all, and I'm going to be busy probably till the middle of August. But uh, every now and then I get a break, and when I do, I'm putting out a podcast. This won't last forever, and my first love is uh, used to be work. Now it's actually this podcast, and I just think about it all the time while I'm working going, oh, do I have 10 minutes? Uh, I would put out like five or 10-minute stories. I could do two of those a day, even working. But people don't like those. Nobody watches them. They they only watch them if they're like 30 minutes or longer. 
I don't want to put out stuff people aren't going to watch, so I'll just wait four or five days until I have time to do two longer or three or four longer stories, and uh, that's how I do it up. But if you guys would like five to ten minute long podcasts, let me know in the comment section because I can do those. I could do one of those a day. All right. Thank you for listening. I hope you all are having a good weekend, staying cool. It's uh, the middle of July. It's hot here. It's going to be a little cooler this week, but pretty hot. It's hot, so y'all stay safe, stay cool, stay hydrated, and we'll see you on the next one. Thanks. Thanks.